Um, so I really am looking forward to um, what's really a, a more of a historical discussion because it's, it's not a proper uh, sermon, although uh, it certainly is an illustration of the truth. Um, and, and as Providence would have it, this is actually a, a topic that Smed had asked me to do back before I, I came here to pastor back in 2017 when uh, GBC hosted the uh, Reformation Conference. And I, I, I did a study of uh, Geneva and how uh, the church in Geneva in the 16th century um, did such a fantastic job of missions. Um, that's kind of an untold story in church history is uh, how Geneva was a missions center. And um, so I titled this uh, Geneva, a model for missions. And I think the study of Geneva will be an encouragement to you because it, what, it, what it's done for me is it's really... Uh, been an encouragement for me in my, my labors in the church and my labors at, at, at the Expositor Seminary. And um, uh, it's just been so encouraging to see someone in another time, in another place, in another venue, in another language, on another continent, doing ministry the same way. And really seeing the gospel uh, go forth from Switzerland back into his, Calvin's native um, France. It's always been the case that the church must produce more churches, not the academy. Uh, the church is the exclusive uh, instrument that God uses to produce more churches. The, the academy will never replace the church in this endeavor. And it seems as though we've tried generation after generation after generation to come up with a, another way to do it. It's almost like a surrogate church. Um, academic institutions, training institutions are trying to fill the need of this void because the church has ceased to be the church when it comes to church planting and training up of pastors. Pastors and preachers must be produced in the church and by the church, not in the academic institution. And, and that's, on, that's honestly said quite commonly. I hear that said and spoken and written in so many contexts but it seems as though it's rarely understood in its implications. I want to read a passage for you from Ephesians chapter 4. And this is a passage, this is one of the many passages that are so helpfully illustrated by the missions endeavor coming out of Geneva in the 16th, in the 16th century. Now I'm going to read to you um, Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 16. It's a rich paragraph explaining how the church actually builds up the church. And of course, as you'll see in the punchline of this paragraph, Paul explains that God is the one producing the growth, but he actually summarizes it in a statement where the church causes the growth of the church. So it's something that God is doing as the head, but it's also appropriate in verse 16 to point out that the church is actively producing the growth of the church as a integrated whole of multifaceted gifting and individuals who contribute to the ministry at large. And so let's pick it up in verse 7. Paul writes, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And that comes from Psalm 68, picturing uh, the Messiah as a triumphal victor, conquering enemies. And so the picture here is um, Christ as Messiah showing dominion over um, host all hostile parties. And then the metaphor of his captives is turned into a gift where those captives are given back to his own people. And it's an, a picture of converts from the kingdom of darkness being transferred to the kingdom of light. And here's the explanation in verse 9. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth, or the lower parts, comma, the earth. He who descended is himself also who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed 
here and there by wind and uh, by the, by, sorry, excuse me, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom, from Christ, the whole body, there's the subject of this verse, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. And here's our verb. Causes the growth of the body. The body causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. It's a powerful passage because this passage explains that God's design is that the planting of churches, the training up of pastors, the spread of the gospel, the fulfillment of the Great Commission, that is not a top-down endeavor. That's not something that's done by the professionals. That's something done by the Christians. The Christians who composed the church, the Christians who were purchased by Christ, whom he conquered as former enemies, whom he brought back into the church and gave as gifts to the church. Um, I recently read a book by Scott Manich, who's a church historian and teaches in, uh, in Deerfield, Illinois. And he wrote a book called Calvin's Company of Pastors. And in, in reading that book, I had this picture in my mind of the three cathedrals that were formerly Roman Catholic before Geneva became Protestant in 1535. Three cathedrals were uh, pastored by eight men. And those eight men preached multiple, multiple times, not only on Sunday, but throughout the week. And then there were lectures given to men who were training for the ministry, and they did it early in the morning so that the working force in Geneva could come hear the lectures talking about the ministry and the spread of the gospel and the equipping of evangelists. And so then you're left with this picture of Geneva, you know, maybe the, maybe the bell rings and it's like workday starts and people are leaving from these lectures, leaving from these sermons, talking about the things of God with their Bibles open, and then they're going back to their shops, back to their farms, back to their ranch. Every, every butcher, baker, and candlestick maker being equipped with truth, talking about the things of God, thinking about the Great Commission. Maybe we can um, update the little uh, lullaby <laughs> to today's vernacular. And um, I tried to think of three things that might represent our church, every carpenter, every cashier, and every civil engineer going back into Tempe, going back into Phoenix, equipped with the truth, talking about the things of God, passionate about the Great Commission, excited about the training of pastors, excited about the planting of churches. That's the picture that I got from 16th century Geneva. Sometimes it's easy to come to church on a Sunday morning and you see the sign out front, that's, you know, the sign over by the seminary room. You know, we have an expositor's campus here. And, uh, oh, you know, the expositor's campus, that's, that's, for, the, that's for the professionals. I'm, I'm just the, uh, the, the, the carpenter, or the cashier, or the civil engineer. I'm glad they do that, and I do what I do. And, and you need to understand, there's something irreplaceable about the equipping that happens in the church. We cannot produce church planters, and we cannot plant churches without the multifaceted gifting that exists inside this body. I can't tell you how, how many times I've seen it in the last 15 years in my involvement with Expositor Seminary, watching young men come to a campus to be equipped, young men who are uh, passionate, young men who have zeal, young men who have their life in front of them, young men who are gifted, but uh, yet never, nevertheless untested. And watching a young man like that come into a home Bible study or a discussion about theology and to see a insurance salesman, fill in the blank, who's lived decades beyond this young man, who's applied the truth with precision through decades of grueling, faithful ministry in the church and in his home. And to see a young man who's if he were in any other context, maybe a lesser equipped church, he might think, I've already arrived. I'm ready to plant a church. But in this context, he realizes, man, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, they got it more, more together than I do. And he might be the right guy to be trained. 
But he still needs to be trained. And it takes the church to do that. This has always been the case. I mean, this sounds so novel for us because we're sitting in the middle of a, maybe a 200-year span of where it just seems like the church has just perpetually neglected its responsibility to plant churches and to train pastors. But this is the norm. This is the biblical ideal, and it does happen in church history. John Wycliffe trained his poor priests at Oxford and Lutterworth who refused to get paid for their ministry because that would have required compromise with the Roman Catholic Church. And they evangelized England 160 years even before the English Reformation. Luther produced preachers through his preaching, and he brought the gospel to the Low Countries, to Denmark, Scandinavia, even Iceland. Thomas Chalmers in, in Scotland produced missionaries through his profound and reverent teaching at St. Andrews and, and in Edinburgh. And here in Geneva, pastors, pastors like Pierre Verret, and Theodore Beza and John Calvin trained up pastors and their secret was not their intellect it wasn't their gifting their secret was their equipped church that was what made all the difference before we look at Geneva I do want to give a brief biographical sketch and I have to emphasize brief um, I want to just mention a few things about his life. Uh, some, for some of you, uh, maybe you've never heard the name John Calvin. For some of you, you've, you've heard him and uh, you hate him. Some of you heard him and you love him. And, and maybe there's a spectrum of, of everyone in between. And, of course, Calvin is not a, uh, a, a perfect man, and he has his faults. Um, but his missionary faithfulness is certainly not one of them. And uh, I want to just give a little bit about his his, um, his life. In fact, I'll give an anecdotal introduction to his life because I, um, I remember, you know, many of you, you know, know my dad who's an elder here at this church and, and I grew up in his home and, and um, I wasn't saved until I was 18 years old. And so before I was 18, uh, I, I, I heard my dad talk theology. I knew, I, I, you know, I knew, knew theology. I'll put that in quotes. In other words, I could borrow theology. I was living on borrowed discernment. I was living on borrowed theology. I was living on borrowed proof texts. Um, I didn't yet, they hadn't grabbed hold of my heart. I hadn't surrendered my will to Christ. Um, I was still living my own life, um, but quite aware of quite a bit of what the Bible said, nevertheless. And, um, and I, I'd always kind of been what you might call a Calvinist, and then, and then I got saved at 18. And don't take that the wrong way. I'm not saying that I repented of, of maybe a view of that might be called Reformed theology as if uh, suddenly I, I, I met the Lord and in profound display of his grace and a profound display of his sovereignty, he overcame my pride and my hostility and surrendered my will to him. And I thanked him and praised him for his grace to me. That's not what changed. Well, what did change was suddenly... I had a passion for the lost, and I had a passion to see my friends come to know the Lord, and I was struggling to know how to reconcile um, sovereignty and the responsibility to respond to the gospel. And uh, several resources that helped me understand the Bible were, were really important as I was reading my Bible in those early days, just devouring it and consuming it. And I'll never forget a conversation I had. I, was, uh, I played volleyball for my, for my school and college, and I, I had a conversation with my my volleyball coach, who was a Christian, um, but he, um, he heard about these, these Christians out there who believe that God's in so he's sovereign. They believe that God's sovereign, he's, as, though, as though he's seated on, seated on the throne of the heavens and he does whatever he pleases <laughs> in the sky and in the sea and all the deeps, as if Psalm 135 were true, you know, one of those crazy Christians. And so he's sitting there talking about one of these crazy Christians, and I said, oh, yeah, I believe that. Really? I never would have imagined. And he started to explain his experience with people like that. And it was a presumption on sovereignty. It was a presumption on people who presumed that God's sovereign, so he'll do whatever he wants. So I'm just going to sit here with my remote in hand and let God save, let God work, and just presume. And I explained to him a, a better way, a more biblical balance. And we don't have time to do all that here. But nevertheless, some of those classic texts, if, you wanna, if, you're, if, if you're asking that question, 
Matthew 11, verses 25 to 30, in one simple paragraph, Jesus explains sovereignty and the need to respond to the gospel in one paragraph. Paul does the same thing between Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 10. Paul explains that tension in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Colossians 1, 28 and 29, responsibility and sovereignty all uh, perfectly harmonized, standing in tension, not diminishing neither sovereignty nor responsibility in any of those texts. And so when you come to a picture like Geneva and the study of Calvin, a lot of times the assumption is, well, why would Calvin even have a missions endeavor? I thought he believed in sovereignty. And of course, it's because he knew that God was sovereign that he knew that the pursuit of evangelism and the training up of pastors and the pursuit of missions and the pursuit of the Great Commission would actually succeed because he was that confident in God's sovereign ability. And so, Calvin's secret was certainly because of his theology, but that's no surprise here if we talk about the um, the doctrines of grace and the responsibility of man and the responsibility of the church to train, the responsibility of Christians to evangelize and the responsibility of preachers to preach and plead with the will to submit to Christ. Those are all true, things that you all appreciate. What this little discussion does this morning here is it, it reconciles a whole other t- tension that we don't think about a lot. And that's that what happened in Geneva was because of the church. And so GBC, as I paint for you a picture here of what happened almost 500 years ago, just picture the connections to GBC. Picture the connections to your responsibility as a church member to be a part of church planting, to be a part of training men. Training men and church planting, that's not a professional uh, endeavor. That's a Christian endeavor. If you were saved, you were saved to be part of this very mission. And Geneva is one of those churches that model it um, in church history. Calvin was born in 1509, and he died in 1564. He died relatively early because of his labors and his poor health, exacerbated by uh, the burden, the profound burdens that he bore and his incredible work ethic. He grew up in a Roman Catholic home in France, and in the early 1520s, he went to, to Paris to study for the priesthood. His father uh, recognized his brilliance and started and pushed him into training for, to be a lawyer. So first he went to the University of Orléans, and that's 90 miles south of Paris. Second, at the University of Bourges in Bourges, France, 150 miles south. Or sorry, um, Orléans is 90 miles, and then Bourges is 150 miles. And uh, here it's where he actually began to study Greek because he was actually pursuing a law degree. And that's where he became um, acquainted with an evangelical scholar named Melchior Volmar who taught him Greek. He got saved somewhere in the late 1520s. We don't actually know. We can't really pin down a date, but um, the late 1520s are, is very plausible. Um, uh, he, he describes his conversion in a rare biographical note on his preface to the Psalms, and he wrote this, but as he, and uh, he's referring, this is David, uh, Calvin writing, and the he here is David uh, in the Psalms, as he was taken from the sheepfold and elevated to the rank of supreme authority, so God, having taken me from my originally obscure and humble condition, has reckoned me worthy of being invested with the honorable office of preacher and minister of the gospel. When I was a very little boy, my father had destined me for the study of theology, but afterwards, when he considered that the legal profession commonly raised those who followed it to wealth, this prospect induced him suddenly to change his purpose. So it came to pass that I was withdrawn from the study of philosophy, and I was put to the study of law. To this pursuit, I endeavored faithfully to apply myself in obedience to the will of my father, but God, by the secret guidance of his providence, at length gave a different direction to my course, and first... Since I was too obstinately devoted to the superstitions of popery to be easily extricated from so profound an abyss of mire, God, by a sudden conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame, which was more hardened in such matters than might have been expected from one at my early period of life. Having thus received some taste of knowledge of of true godliness, I was immediately inflamed with so intense a desire 
to make progress therein that although I did not leave altogether leave off other studies, I yet pursued them with less ardor. I was quite yet surprised that before a year had elapsed, all who had any desire after purer doctrine were continually coming to me to learn, although I myself was as yet but a novice and a tyro. It seems that God typically uses the hardness, the obstinate, enslaved nature of one's previous life to magnify his grace. That's exactly what he did with the Apostle Paul. Remember First Timothy chapter 1? The grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And not only does God some, often use our past life to magnify his grace, but he also uses our past life often to deepen longing and desire, conviction and zeal and a value of the truth. Paul continues on in that same letter in chapter 4 to write this. To Timothy, he says, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. And Calvin certainly modeled that. After one year of conversion, his hardness in papacy being so strong that his conversion had to be so radical that after one year of walking with Christ, people looked to him as an expert. He was just consuming God's word and consuming truth, needing answers. In 1533, his evangelical convictions had become so known and marked and obvious that he had to flee for fear of persecution. In fact, at the University of Paris, Nicholas Kopp delivered a, an, an, an um, it's typical that a student would deliver an address at the uh, University of Paris, and so Nicholas Cobb delivered it. He was a personal friend of Calvin, and Calvin quite possibly helped him write this address, and it, it, it was very volatile, and Cobb had to flee the country. He had, to, um, he had to go into exile. Calvin left Paris in the latter half of the month. That was November of 1533. In 1534, by 1534, people in France are dying for the evangelical faith. In 1535, um, Calvin's personal friend and a former roommate, Etienne de la Forge, it was a, he was a merchant who he had roomed with in Paris. He was um, burned for his, Calvin, for his reformed convictions. In 1536, that's the uh, year that he first published the Institutes of the Ca uh, Christian Religion. It's much smaller than the one that we have now. The one we have now is based on the fourth edition of the French and the second edition of the Latin. It's, it's several a couple volumes. His first edition was about six chapters long. It was just kind of an introduction to, Catholic, to, to Christian truth to the Catholic state, and he addressed it to Francis I, and his idea is basically saying, as a young man even, um, King Francis, you need to know what the people believe that you're killing. You need to know why they're willing to die. Talk about a noble reason to write theology. This was no, this is the opposite of what you see today, people writing theology to make a, make a buck and get the right publisher and to promote it with all the social media outlets. I mean, this was because people were dying and he said, Francis, Francis you need to know why these people are willing to die. So he has to flee the country and he was committed to pursuing a scholarly life and the famous part of the story that several of you are probably familiar with, probably most of you, in 1536 is the year he gets to Geneva, and he's just stopping there because he had to avoid a, a battle and a war, but he gets to uh, uh, Geneva, and um, Guillaume Farrell, the uh, reformer who is just a passionate preacher there, he, uh, hears that Calvin's in town, like, and they just know him as the guy who wrote the, the Institutes to, to Francis I, and um, so he's there just trying to spend the night and sneak out the following day so they can go in peace and pursue his scholarly career. But Farrell finds him, and, um, and, and, he, and Pierre Verret was with him, and they, they basically accost him. And um, here's how Calvin describes um, uh, the, this encounter. Farrell, who burned with an extraordinary zeal to advance the gospel 
immediately strained every nerve to detain me, and after learning that my heart was set upon devoting myself to private studies, for which I wished to keep myself free from other pursuits, and finding that he gained nothing by entreaties, he proceeded to utter an imprecation that God would curse my retirement and the tranquility of the studies which I sought if I should withdraw and refuse to give assistance where the necessity was so urgent. By this imprecation, I was so stricken with terror that I desisted from, my, from the journey which I had undertaken. But sensible of my natural bashfulness and timidity, I would not bring myself under obligation to discharge any particular office. And that's the beginning of his ministry in Geneva. He ministers alongside Farrell uh, for several years, from 1536 to 1538. In 1538, after two years of ministry, he has to flee Geneva because he gets sideways with the civil authorities. The civil authorities are offended by his uh, seeking to establish church discipline, or at least, uh, at least at that level, at that early date, at least establishing authority over the church that would be held by the pastors who were recognized as the men who held the authority over the church. So he's trying to establish in the, in the middle of a, of a kind of a city-state state form of Protestantism, he's establishing uh, autonomy in the local church and gets kicked out of town for it. In 1538, he has to flee to Strasbourg. He ministers there with uh, Martin Bucer. Who, Martin Bucer, who um, was converted under Luther's preaching at Heidelberg in 1518, is preaching there, and he's ministering faithfully, and there's a really strong group of Christians in Strasbourg. And Martin Bucer, one of the most important things that happens to Calvin in Strasbourg is that he learns oh, and watches how Martin Bucer is practi practicing the, the half dozen or so passages in the New Testament that talk about church discipline. And that's something he really hadn't been exposed to. I mean, he obviously had studied the scriptures, but he's seen it played out in this church in Strasbourg, which is, you know, it kind of goes, it's on the border. It goes back and forth in church history. At that point, it was France, then later it was Germany. Now it's back to France again. But in Strasbourg, France, he's seen something he's never seen before, namely biblical ecclesiology. A couple of other things happen. He writes a second edition of his institutes. Um, he also, um, he has several friends who are apparently matchmakers who wanted to set him up with a woman, and um, Calvin wasn't certain, very uh, happy about it. Um, she was a noble woman, a, a certain damsel of noble rank, and um, he wasn't happy about it because she didn't speak any French. Um, uh, but this is worth mentioning. I kind of enjoy this story. Um, his, her brother and his wife were very keen that the match should go through. Calvin agreed on the condition that she would promise to learn French. Antoine was dispatched to escort her to Strasbourg, and the wedding was fixed for not later than March 10th of 1540. But on the 29th of March, they were still not married, and Calvin was saying that he would never marry her unless the Lord had entirely bereft me of my wits. So needless to say, the matchmaking did not go well. So that it fell through, but the following year, it was, turned, it was much better. He married a, an Anabaptist widow named, named Idolette de Bure. Um, she had two children, um, and uh, Idolet had one boy, they had one boy together, and he was born premature and died shortly after. And then she died in, in 1549, so Calvin was only married for nine years, and um, just knew, knew the, the, the joys of marriage, knew the burdens of, of burying a wife and burying a child. He was committed to being single the rest of his life, and... Um, he returns to Geneva in 1541 after three years of exile. He comes back, and I'll explain why he comes back in just a second, but he picks up in the pulpit on the, in the very verse where he left off in three years earlier. He was just so committed to the exposition of God's word. He has a frenetic ministry. He would preach twice on Sundays, once every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, in October of 1549, sermons were, he preached a sermon every day, and then and from then on for the rest of his ministry, he would usually preach every day on alternate weeks as well as twice on Sunday. So two on Sunday, then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then two more on Sunday, and then he'd have a week off to prepare for the following week of marathon sermons. And so at that pace, he would have preached 210 sermons a year, preached without notes, directly from the Hebrew and directly from the Greek. His preaching was lively and 
passionate and easy to follow, and that's why he preached without notes, to remind himself he's preaching to the people. So he would actually look his people in the eyes. He had his original text right there, and he would just be delivering what the meaning of that text was to the people he wanted to communicate it to. And here's an example of his kind of um, lively, in engaging preaching. And you can almost picture him kind of having this conversation between two arguing parties. Here's, a, here's an example of one of his, from one of his sermons. We can see many who are enraged when we correct or threaten them. What? Is this the way you teach? And so he kind of was fond of even mimicking people who would critique him. What? Is this the way you preach? We want to be won over by kindness. Do you? Well, then go to God and learn how he teaches you. See how these sensitive souls cannot bear a single reproof to be offered them? And why? Oh, we want to be taught differently from this. Well, then go to the devil's school. He will flatter you well enough to your perdition. So I don't think that would, I don't think anybody would have been sleeping on a Sunday morning in, in St. Pierre's. I mean, it's just lively, just getting right after it. I mean, the guy just lived on a constant threat, constant danger, and so that's just, that's just his life. I'm going to skip the rest of his life because that's going to be the story of the unfolding of the church in Geneva, but he does die in 1564, and by the end of Calvin's life, the state of France was radically different. Okay, Geneva is in Switzerland, right across the border, and Calvin was from France, and he was training mostly, the, the massive majority of the men in the academy um, at St. Pierre's were French, and many of them went back into France. What happened was St. Pierre was training up so many men so effectively that churches were being planted, particularly the last decade of Calvin's life, at such a rate and at such a strength and at such a depth and at such a profundity that you could, you, I don't think you can overstate how dark of a scene it was when Calvin left France to the hope on the landscape of the evangelical scene in France when Calvin died. I'll give you some stats here toward the end, but let me just try to tell you the story. In, in order to um, wa dive into the story of the church and the ecclesiology, there's a couple of, couple of areas I have to clear up. This is kind of like a historical. These are kind of some of those historical uh, details that muddy the waters as we try to study uh, 16th century Geneva. And this is where a lot, of the, a lot of the confusion happens, and this is where the story can get a little bit convoluted. So I want to clear some things. First of all, Calvin's political involvement. Calvin's political involvement. Sometimes people look at Geneva and they might, you might dismiss this account as, as having anything to do with Grace Bible Church because you might think, as it's often said, well, the church in Geneva was a city-state. And that's not quite true. It's certainly not like America in the separation of church and state, but it's not a state church like uh, the Netherlands in the 1900s or England since Anglicanism or anything like that. It's radically, radically different. Uh, when I went to Geneva, um, I think the first time I was in Geneva, I spent a couple days with uh, John Glass, who's a missionary there, and he planted a church in Geneva, and he was, he was describing the popular sentiment that uh, in, people looked back at um, Calvin, you know, now there's a, there's a Reformation wall that has um, the four, four reformers there, and Calvin's the one holding, you know, with his finger in the, in the, in the scriptures, and he's, he's slightly, his posture is slightly forward from the other four. So everybody in Geneva knows who Calvin is. I mean, he's like, it's like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington for us. It's just Calvin. And so they just, the popular view is that Calvin was this like dictator type mayor who just made sure no one had any fun. That's kind of how, that's like his, the popular reputation for, for Calvin. Um, and it just couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, what's funny about the idea of Calvin being some sort of politically involved guy is that he was French. He wasn't even a Swiss citizen. He couldn't even vote. He didn't even get bourgeois status until he was 59 years old. Oh, I'm sorry, no, 19, uh, 1559. So he wasn't even 59 years old. Uh, it wasn't even until his last five years of his life before he died that he could even vote. I mean, he, was, he had no political office. He had no political authority. He was simply a pastor. And that's important to remember. There was, uh, there's actually no truth to the idea of Calvin being the dictator of Geneva. That's just completely fabricated. And um, 
And I would say that it's, it's, it's interesting. There is a connection between the church and state that Calvin had to navigate, and he would meet with the civil, the petite council, which is about 25 civil leaders who governed Geneva. He would meet with them every week, and they would talk about the cities of the state and the cities of the church. And the state actually paid for the salaries of the pastors of the church. So you, it's right to say that Geneva as a city-state was politically Protestant, but that does not mean that they were evangelical in the sense that they believed the gospel. Calvin, instead, had to spend his entire ministry up until the 1550s fighting for the right of the local church elders to have authority in the church to even practice church discipline. So there's just no truth to the fact that this is some sort of confusion of civil government and church authority. Secondly, I want to clear up a quick comment about Calvin's theology. And I've already introduced this. Calvin's theology. And I mentioned to you the confusion even of my college volleyball coach, who was a, a believer. I, I, tr I trust he was a true Christian, but confused about God's sovereignty and confused about salvation in a few areas, um, particularly because of his appropriate zeal for evangelism. And this has become quite common as people have studied uh, 16th century Geneva or even studied Calvin, that the accusation is, is that, well, there really was no missions movement to speak of from the reformers. And um, when I hear something like that, people that I've benefited from that I can tell is just so patently untrue, it kind of becomes an itch. And so I have, um, over the years, taught biographies on Luther as a missionary, on Calvin as a missionary, on Wycliffe as a missionary, and, and a lot that was happening in the Reformation that produced missions. And it's just amazing to me how many people believe that there, is, there was no mission to speak of from Geneva. One of the worst examples of this is Alistair McGrath, and he wrote a book called Christianity's Dangerous Idea. And he says that both Luther and Calvin were emphatic that Catholicism and Orthodoxy were Christian. What they required, they argue, was Reformation. And he goes on in this book, uh, Christianity's Dangerous Idea, to say that from Calvin's view, he wasn't doing missions in neighboring areas because he viewed those neighboring areas as Christian because they were Catholic. And so, you know, you have to go somewhere to find, like, find Muslims or whatever. I, I don't know what he was, I don't know what Alistair McGrath thought Calvin was looking for, but he did, he, he, he's under the confusion that, that Calvin is thinking these people are reached, they just need to be, you know, have, have some different views on some things. He goes on, McGrath goes on to appeal to a, um, a German scholar named Gustav Vorneck, and he, gave, he gives three reasons why there's no missions coming out of the Reformation. Number one, early Protestants interpreted the Great Commission as an exclusively apostolic mandate. Yeah, go and preach the gospel, make disciples. Yeah, that's what the 12 did. Glad that's over with. That's the, idea. That's the accusation. That's what's being said about the reformers. It's like, okay, Great Commission was for the apostolic age. Good, we moved on. We outgrew that. Number two, the end was close. Christ is coming back. No reason to embark now. <laughs> Waste of time. He's coming back. That's what he says the reformers are thinking. And then number three, and this is really the one that actually still sticks today. God would convert people in his own time. God's going to convert. So what's with all this effort to do missions, to train pastors, to plant churches, to share the gospel, to see people matured and edified, to see gospel witnesses replicated in another part of the world? And so that still sticks today. The idea is, it's kind of like what happened in William Carey's day when um, a group of um, Baptist ministers met in 1792 to discuss the duty of Christians to attempt uh, to, to spread the gospel to, to pagan nations. And um, an old minister stands up to rebuke William Carey, who's passionate about getting the gospel out, the older minister said to him, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. Alistair McGrath quotes that story and says, that's Vornick's third point precisely. That's why the reformers never had any missions. 
Well, first of all, the idea that Calvin thought that the Great Commission was apostolic is just patently fictional. Uh, you can read his commentary on Matthew 28, verse 19, and he clearly states, quote, But now the wall of partition has been broken down, and the Lord commands the ministers of the gospel to go a distance in order to spread the doctrine of salvation in every part of the world. That's a direct quote from Calvin. And so the idea that uh, that's, there's no missions or missions passion because of some confusion about the, the mandate being for Apostles, apostles only is, is patently false. But worse, this one that still remains today, the idea that God's going to convert people in his own time, that's just a critique of, certainly it's a critique of hyper-Calvinism, and I've, I've seen that. I've experienced that, but that's certainly not where Geneva was. That's certainly not where Calvin was historically. So having cleared those two things up, we've got about 15 minutes to draw these, a tight line between ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and missions, specifically missions by way of training up pastors and preachers, training up evangelists, and doing church planting. What happened? Missions exploded in 1555, and this is due to the inseparable link between the doctrine of the church and the doctrine of missions. Michael Haken who is a historian from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, he wrote this. It's been estimated that by 1562, and if to put it in perspective here, 1562 is two years before Calvin dies. 1562, so two years before he dies. It's estimated that by 1562, some 2,150 congregations had been established in France with around 2 million members. Many of them converted through the witness of men trained in Geneva. That two million comprised 50% of the upper and middle classes and a full 10% of the entire population. The growth is enormous when one reckons that at the time of Calvin's conversion, there were probably no more than 3,000 or 4,000 evangelicals in France. 3,000 or 4,000 evangelicals. 3,000 or 4,000, again, very difficult to you know, come up with you, what do those terms mean and then how do you even evaluate that? Um, in 15, well, when he left, which would have been 1535, 36. Uh, pretty hard to guess, but if that's even a reasonable estimate, that's massive, massive growth. That's, that's what I would call a veritable revival in about 30 years. Why 1555? What happened? The difference here is the difference between a church plant and an established church. I want to read to you, uh, this is a little bit of a lengthy quote. I know you're, I know you're up for it. Um, and I also feel like I need to just, um, you know, um, honor a debt here. Uh, one of the, the great, easily the greatest thing I've ever read on Calvin's um, missionary endeavors was a paper read in 1992 at Westminster Chapel by a French historian named Jean-Marc Berthoud. And he wrote a, a paper on um, Calvin's uh, and the gospel and the spread of the gospel in France. And um, hopefully my pronunciation is correct. Uh, you, you French speakers are just cringing. I, I know because I was explaining this to John Glass. When I was talking to John Glass, I was like, I had just read that article. And so I'm like, hey, I just read this amazing article. You ever heard of, you ever heard of Jean-Marc Berthoud? He's like, no, I never heard of him. Yeah, that's really good. So I keep, I go on and start talking about this article. And he's like, wait, what, what's his name? I said it again. He's like, how do you spell it? B-E-R-T-H-O-U-D. Oh, Berthou, Berthou, yes, I know him personally. And I'm like, oh, okay, sure. I just butchered his pronunciation so bad, you, I, you couldn't even recognize who I was talking about. So anyway, I apologize for any of my French here that has to come out in this quote. In 1555, the first organized Reformed church in France was established in Paris. Such a congregation with its consistory of elders, its deacons, and its discipline was established on the model of the Genevan church. In contrast to the numerous unorganized groups existing at the time throughout France, groups meeting for Bible study and prayer, uh, Iglesie Planti, Planti, Iglesies Planti, I think, is, and that's, that's just what he says, there's, we'll call that planted churches, a planted church. Um, such, these organ, or, uh, organized congregations were called Iglesie Dressy, and that's, he translates it dressed church, 
looked at, I looked at some other translations, um, established church, a standing church. So maybe established is better even than dressed. An established church versus a church plant. That's the distinction. These were capable of faithfully teaching, nourishing, and ruling the local church. According to figures given by Admiral de Coligny to Catherine de' Medici, there existed seven years later in March 1562 no less than 2,150 such dressed churches, established churches in the kingdom of France. There was not a single established church when Calvin left France that, the, that, that the, any historian I've ever heard document. That means no known evangelical church, you would have groups of evangelicals gathering together in hiding as they're being persecuted, reading their Bibles, for sure. But what you do not have is trained preachers with plurality of elders practicing church discipline, seeing replication happening. Not a single one. And by 1562, no less than 2,150 established churches in the nation of France. At the end of 1561, Berthu continues, at the end of 1561, Pierre Verret, the great reformer and ethicist from the canton of Vaud, exiled from Lausanne by the Bernese authorities for insisting on the establishment of a church-controlled discipline, was preaching to 8,000 communicants in the town, town of Nîmes. Uh, through the evangelical, though the evangelical faith had been growing sharply in France since the late 20s, uh, to the years 1555 to 1562 saw an unprecedented explosion both of conversion to the Reformed faith and the establishment of formally organized congregations. In 1536, when Calvin came to Geneva, what he came to in Geneva was technically a church plant. It wasn't even a viable established church by the New Testament definition of preaching, leadership, church discipline, plurality of elders. The next two years witnessed the attempts of Farrell and Calvin to turn it into an established church, but lacking the inherent authority. To, they obviously had the biblical authority. That's, that's, no, that's never in question. But the civil authority prevented them from doing that and effectively drove them out of town then, as I mentioned earlier. And then when he came back in 1541, here's, here's where it's important to understand why did he come back. If he got run out of town, why did they even ask him back? Well, they realized Calvin's appeal. They realized that he was popular with the people because they were learning. They were learning the truth. They were growing in Christ. And so it wasn't really for theological reasons they brought him back. It was more for civil reasons that the civil authorities brought Calvin back. Calvin came back on one stipulation. He said, I'll come back if you allow me and the other pastors to practice, have, to have spiritual authority over the church to practice church discipline. This is not a civil function, this is a spiritual function. And you can see what they're, what they're fighting for in church history is called the sword, it's the, you know, the sword of two powers. You've got the civil sword, you've got the uh, spiritual sword. They're fighting for the spiritual sword, which is actually what constitutes a true church. The, the right to draw lines in the sand to be able to recognize what heaven's already recognized, who's in the church and who's out. And they didn't have that until 1541. When he comes back in 1541, they have that authority on paper and thus ensues the next 14-year battle with the Libertines to establish that authority in the church. This battle was, was profound. You can just picture Calvin preaching from 1541 to 1555 for 14 years, and there's not much of a notable impact on missions. Not because it's not his heartbeat, it's not because it's not his passion, it's because the church is starting to become the church. And it takes, it takes time. And there has to be depth. And there has to be stability. And there has to be the mature product so that what's being sent out from the mature product can even recognize what the target actually is. It puts flesh and blood on the New Testament mandates of what the church is. But Calvin was in the battle of his life. He was battling ecclesiological compromise. During the 40s, he was battling to establish the faith in the church in Geneva, and he was, he was battling this compromise with the Roman Catholic Church. He's trying to battle Catholicism on one hand, and then he's, on the other hand, he's battling 
civil Protestantism. <laughs> he had enemies on every side. Calvin wrote um, in a letter addressed to Martin Luther, uh, I don't believe they ever met, but he did, they did have some correspondence. Here's one example. He, he wrote to Luther um, about this battle against evangelical compromise with Rome, and he's seen the evangelicals of his city compromising with Rome doctrinally. He writes, when I noticed that though many of our French people had been brought out of the darkness of the papacy to the soundness of the faith, there were still some who had altered nothing as to their public profession and that they continued to defile themselves with the sacrilegious worship of the papists, as if they had never tasted the savor of true doctrine. I was altogether unable to restrain myself from reproving so great indolence in the way I thought it deserved. So you can see what's happening here. You've got a civil authority telling you, no, you don't have any right to do anything, and you've got people in your church who are believing Christ-denying heresies uh, taught to them by the Roman Catholic Church, and they're not willing to give those things up. Meanwhile, he's also trying to, he's trying to train pastors because he's trying to train pastors not only for France, but also for Geneva. In fact, it's interesting that um, in the seven decades, from starting from Calvin's ministry up until Beza dies, in the seven decades in Geneva, over 50% of the pastors in Geneva, which is about 130 on the list of people who were pastoring in Geneva, as, any, many, as, as little as eight to as many as uh, dozens at a time, over 50% of them were trained in the church at the academy that was on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on that church there in St. Pierre's in Geneva. And so he's passionate about training men. Um, let me just keep, put an put a image in your mind here for a second. Think about, think about the places we want to reach. Cities in this country, cities in other countries. Imagine a ragtag group of believers with no leadership. One of my personal friends, Matt Johnson, I remember talking with him as he was finishing up his language training. He was in Rome, he and his wife Johanna were looking at where they were gonna go and then in God's providence, they got connected with Massimo Malika who were missionaries here and I remember in those days talking with Matt, just thinking about the, the, where, where Italy was at and, and the great need. And, you know, and I'm, and I'm, you know in my ignorance, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I know of a, maybe a handful of cities in, in, uh, in Italy. And he mentions, man, Genoa is just a, a massive need. I'm like, Genoa? Yeah, I mean, I've, like the salami, sure. Uh, what, what? It's a city of over a million people. And there's really no viable evangelical pulpit in that city. He shows up and there are Christians there just hanging on for dear life with nothing but a copy of the scriptures in Italian. Imagine the cities that don't have any voice of Christ. Imagine the cities in this country where there are currently no men giving God's word a voice. How's that going to change? Those men have to be trained. They need, they need leadership. They need, they need somebody who can bring them along to see a church plant become an established church. Elders raised up to see the word of God do its work. Men who are skilled who are gifted, who are humble, who will get out of the way so that God will do an incredible work. Calvin was doing that for 14 years with his hands tied. The training of men it's interesting, the training of men actually started threatening King Henry. King Henry was ruling in France, and um, the Edict of Ecuin was made in 1559, and that was uh, an edict that required Protestants to be burned in France. And that's actually quite interesting, that it, Calvin's missionary endeavors really got off the ground around mid-50s, and within four years, the king is making an edict to burn Protestants because of the, Im because of the impact it's having on his ability to, to uh, keep the, the nation Catholic. That's a profound, profound influence. 
Here's Berthu's des description and explanation of of the importance of the church and its connection to what's happening in France. I'm gonna read this, I know this is quite, this is a little bit long, but we gotta got get one more in here. No divisive, no decisive direct action in favor of the persecuted communities in France could be undertaken until the position of the Reformation in Geneva had been decisively consolidated. For the situation was far too dangerous internationally and Geneva was too exposed to external attack to permit a policy of expansion into France without the basic security of being able to count on the absolute backing of the councils of the Republic. Early in 1559, Henry II of France had been obliged to abandon half a century of French conquests in northern Italy in order to devote all his energies to facing the international menace of his absolutist monarchy constituted by this rapidly growing Huguenot movement. For he had belatedly come to understand that if the cursed Genevan heresy prevailed in France, it would prove not only the destruction of the Roman religion, but the ruin of libertine civilization of the Renaissance. It would also lead undoubtedly to the fall of the Vol um, Valois, the Val House of Valois is um, Henry's, Henry's dynasty, uh, and to the fall of their pretensions to royal absolutist rule over France. So you can see it's like the French coming in, uh, the Huguenots coming in, the Protestants coming in and seeing this revival is actually requiring military force to put down these heretics that's actually prohibiting them from waging the wars on the fronts that they need to wage. It's messing up their politics. But again, how did we get there? The issue was you don't, you don't have a healthy church, you don't have a sending church until you have a pure church. And I'm going to teach on that in a couple of Sundays and the importance of a pure church for the sake of the power of the church. The power of the church comes from its holiness. That's always been the case. And we'll look at that from Matthew 16 and Acts 5, Lord willing. But needless to say, Calvin understood that. And so he fought for church discipline. Here's how this played out. And I'm just going to tell this story because I realize I'm out of time. The Libertines were a group of uh, citizens, civilians in Geneva, and they were high-ranking, they were nobility. In fact, one of the famous, uh, the, the families were the Perrins, the um, uh, Favres, uh, Brett Favre might have been descended from the Libertines, I wouldn't know. Um, Berthelier and the Vandals. Berthelier was particularly a notable Libertine because Berthelier, or Berthelier, I believe, something like that, Berthelier, he just makes the last 17 letters silent and then it sounds French. However you pronounce that name, he, he his, his father was actually killed in defending Geneva. So. From a secular standpoint, he, he's a hero. So the son now is in Geneva, in the, you know, kind of in his uh, prime of life, uh, just swimming in all the applause and all the kudos that come from his dad being a patriarch of the, of the city. He's attending the church. He's a good, upstanding citizen. That's just what he does. Everybody just goes to St. Pierre's because that's what you do in Geneva. But he is a libertine. What that means is he was a partier. He was an ungodly man. He was a drunk. He was a womanizer. He mocked Calvin, he critiqued Calvin, he berated him, he threatened him, and that's all in print and that's all recorded. Calvin kept explaining, I need the right to discipline, and then they hear, oh, you're going to discipline Berthelier? I don't think so. And so finally, the showdown happened in 1556, even though he had he'd, he'd had the, the authority on paper, uh, he never had been able to exercise it, and finally it got so bad that when Berthelier showed up at church to take the Lord's Supper as a drunken womanizer, and the civil authorities were still holding his hands from letting the church be the church, he took matters into his own hands. He, and I'm trying to find where the story starts here. Oh, I passed it. There we go. This is what happens when you skip in your notes. So it was uh, 1553, and Calvin is preaching, and he closes the sermon with these words. As for me, as long as the Lord leaves me here, and he has given me a firm resolution, and I've taken it from him. And as he says that, you can just hear it, can't you? I've taken my authority from the Lord, even though the civil authorities have never gave me this authority. God told me to do this. I shall make good use of it 
whatever the consequences may be, and I shall govern myself according to the clear and well-known rule of my Lord. As we are about to receive the Holy Communion, if anyone who is excluded by the consistory, and the consistory is the French term for the elders, if anyone who is excluded by the consistory attempts to partake of this table on my life, I shall show myself as I am. And um, to, to appreciate this scene, just understand, Berthelier shows up, and he's, I mean, he's a nobleman. He's wearing his sword. This is not like an empty threat. Uh, this might, there's, a, there's a very real cost that could be involved. He comes down out of the pulpit. If you've seen it, if you've been there, you know that little spiral staircase. He comes down out of the pulpit. He goes and stands in front of the elements. And he says, holding forth his hands over the sacred elements, Calvin addresses the church and he says, you may break these limbs, you may take my life, my blood is yours, shed it. But never will any of you force me to give holy things to profane men and thus to dishonor the table of my God. It was too much for Bethelier and he left without partaking of communion. That was 15... 53, Calvin never looked back. The church began to function as a church in the New Testament sense. The training of men was conducted by equipped saints within the church. Every butcher, baker, candlestick maker who's walking with the Lord, who's living an upright life, who's using his gifts to pour into the Great Commission is now all of those energies, all of those resources, all of those efforts are unified in holiness and in purity on the goal, which is the Great Commission. And men are being trained up and sent out. It became known as Calvin's school of death. Many of these men went to their death. They had to learn Calvin's exegesis. They had to learn the biblical languages and plus Latin if they didn't know it already. And then they had to be trained in pastoral residency for multiple, multiple years until they could be affirmed and ready to send out. And then they would send them out secretly with no fanfare. In fact, not even letting the congregation know because many of them were going to their death. Calvin wrote a famous letter to the five who were trained by him and Pierre Verret who were in prison in Lyon. And he tells them, man, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but if it turns out in your bloodshed, it could not have been in vain. That's what the cost was. It was a cost that they counted every time they sent another man out. Churches produce missionaries, not individuals, not institutions. This isn't the story of Calvin. This is the story of the congregation at Geneva. It's the story of God. It's the story of how God produced church plants, pastors and preachers, church planners, through a church. GBC, my prayer is just that this historical study would just be an encouragement. It's an illustration of Ephesians 4. It's an illustration of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. It's an illustration of New Testament ecclesiology. It's just an illustration of the truths that we love and I pray that it's an encouragement as we think about what it means for us as a congregation to get our hearts and minds and resources around what it means to be involved in the Great Commission. Let me uh, close in a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for examples, examples of others and other congregations who have gone before us who were faithful. And thank you so much for how that is an encouragement to us, especially when we cross... Um, oceans and we cross languages and we cross centuries and we see people with this tr same transcendent Bible doing ministry the same way. I pray that it would be an encouragement for where we are rightly applying the truth of your word and wherever it causes us to ask questions, I pray that it would drive us back to your word and I pray that for every Christian here, the thought on our mind would be well, how do we play our role? We must be involved. We must be passionate. We must be devoted to. We must be committed to, to the sending and or the going. And I pray, Lord, that you would direct us and give us wisdom for that end. Give the leadership of the church wisdom as we think about both of those um, venues, the sending and the going. Give the church and give each individual family wisdom about uh, the sending and the going. 
and help us to recognize our gifts humbly and soberly so that we would um, be exactly where you want us to be as we seek to um, make the greatest impact uh, by your grace and as you work through us um, for the sake of your kingdom. That's our goal. And uh, we just pray that you'd bless that, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.